Tonight's program attempts to tell the story of Baha'u'llah's life and teachings through a combination of drama, video, song, storytelling, readings, prayers, and narrative. It is, of course, utterly impossible to distill the 40 years of Baha'u'llah's mission into a one-hour program. Our hope is that by highlighting some of the most interesting features of Baha'u'llah's story in our program tonight, you will get some small taste of the towering majesty of his person, the broad scope of his teachings, the intense suffering he was forced to endure, and the consuming fire of love and devotion that he kindled in the hearts of his devoted followers. We hope you will also get a picture, no matter how inadequate, of what the Baha'i community in Whittlesea and worldwide is doing to respond to the bold and challenging summons that Baha'u'llah, the promised one of the ages, has issued to his followers and to all of the people of the earth. Without further ado, I invite you to enjoy tonight's program, A Gift for Baha'u'llah. Sweetheart, what do you think we could give as a birthday present for Baha'u'llah this year? What do you mean, Mum? I was just thinking about a phrase from a letter we studied today in my Ruhi study circle. It was from the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Australia last year. They talked about how important the bicentenary celebrations are, and you and I already talked about that. But they also suggested we look for the perfect gift that we will give to Baha'u'llah on the day of his birth. Was that something just for you, or is everyone supposed to give Baha'u'llah a gift? Oh. I don't think we'd say anyone is supposed to give Baha'u'llah a gift. I think it's more like we want to give him something and just have to figure out what is right for us. What kinds of things have you, have you been thinking? Well, it's hard to know what kind of gift is appropriate. There's nothing that I could possibly give him that he has any need of. Yeah, that's right. You fixing my hair makes me remember a story from our children's classes about Baha'u'llah's father that says something like that. When Baha'u'llah was still a child, the vizier, his father, dreamed a dream. Baha'u'llah appeared in a vast, limitless ocean. His body shone upon the waters with the radiance that illumined the whole sea. Around his head, it, with every direction, his long jet black locks floated in great profusion above the waves. As he dreamed, a multitude of fishes came around him, each holding fast to the end of one hair. Fascinated by the effulgence of his face, they followed him in whatever direction he swam. Great as was their number, and however firmly they cling to him, no one single hair has been detached from his hair, nor any injury affected his person. Free and unrestrained means freely and without any restriction. He moved about the waters and they all followed him. The vizier, greatly impressed by this dream, summoned a soothsayer. Now, a soothsayer is a person who can predict about future. So the vizier wanted to know what that dream meant. And he called this, this person, this man who was very well known in that region. This man, as if inspired by a premonition of the future glory of Baha'u'llah declared. <clears throat> the limitless ocean that you have seen in your dream, O Vazir, is none other than this world of being. Single-handed and alone, your son will achieve supreme ascendancy over it. Wherever he may please, he will proceed unhindered. No one will resist his march 
no one will hinder his progress. The multitude of fishes signifies the turmoil which he will arouse amidst the people of the, on the earth. Around him they will gather, and to him they will cling. Assured of the unfailing protection of the Almighty, this tumult will never harm his person, nor will his loneliness upon the sea of, of life will endanger his safety. That was very beautiful, Sarah. Thank you for sharing that with me. Sure, Mum. It doesn't make it any easier to figure out what to give to Bahá'u'lláh, though, does it? No, I suppose not. But we will have to think about that in the morning. Because now, it's bedtime. Would you like to read a passage from the writings before you go to sleep? I could recite one that I've memorised. Perhaps the Nightingale one. Okay, I will. Oh, and here it is in case I forget part of it. Release yourselves, O nightingales of God, from the thorns and brambles of wretchedness and misery, and wing your flight to the rose garden of unfading splendour. O my friends that dwell upon the dust, haste forth unto your celestial habitation, announce unto yourselves the joyful tidings. He who is the best beloved is come. He hath crowned himself with the glory of God's revelation and hath unlocked to the face of men the doors of his ancient paradise. Let all eyes rejoice and let every ear be gladdened, for now is the time to gaze on his beauty. Now is the fit time to hearken, hearken, hearken to his voice. Proclaim unto every longing lover, Behold, your well-beloved hath come, hath come among men, and to the messengers of the monarch, monarch, monarch of love, impart the tidings. Lo, the adored one hath appeared arrayed in the fullness of his glory. Good job, Sarah. There's more, but I haven't memorised all of that yet. I think that's enough for tonight. Perhaps you'll dream about Nightingale. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good night, Mum. Good night, sweetheart. It is so wonderful of you to have come. We're in the garden of Reslon, aren't we? That's right, honoured lady. The blessed perfection has honoured this garden with the name Paradise. Is Baha'u'llah in the tent? He was. He is now wandering through the garden, greeting the many guests who have come to bid him farewell. Oh, and you are Nabil, aren't you? That's right, honoured lady. I have the privilege of being one of the companions of His Holiness Baha'u'llah. You look tired. Have you not been sleeping well? Ah, where do I begin? It was a few days ago, as I was about to lie down, I saw Baha'u'llah arise from his couch, and so I followed him. I had to walk very close to him to hear his words. And he said, Consider these nightingales. So great is their love for these roses, that sleepless from dusk till dawn, they warble their melodies and commune with burning passion with the object of their adoration. How then can those who claim to be a fire with the rose-like beauty of the beloved choose to sleep? For three days and for three nights, 
I have circled round his tent and seen how he is ceaselessly in conversation with the many guests who have come to bid him farewell. Every word he says is imbued with such wisdom and there is not the least trace of any confusion in anything he says or does. Well, what is that big pile that I can see in the tent? Every day before dawn, the gardeners pick roses from the four avenues within the garden and pile them in a big heap in the center of the tent of the whole lot. So great is this pile that when we come for our morning tea, <laughs> we can't even see each other from across it. Behold then with his own hands entrust these roses to those whom he dismisses from his presence to be delivered to the many guests throughout the city. What a blessing to be so near him. It is more of a, it is more of a blessing than you may realize. Come, I shall share with you a secret. Over the last few days, Baha'u'llah has started to reveal to his close family and friends that he is indeed whom the Bab referred to as him whom God shall make manifest. Many of us had guessed this long ago, but only recently has he started to openly declare it. There are so few of us who know about this, but one day it will be as manifest as the midday sun. Yes. These days of the Resvan Garden will be celebrated for years to come, dear Nabil. Yes, yes, that's right. These days have a potency unmatched by anything in the past. Oh, before I forget, I have a gift for you. Thank you. Alas, our time together has come to an end. It is now time for you to return to your time and to your place. Thank you for sharing with me with joy and love. <clears throat> Good morning, Mom. Good morning, sweetheart. Guess what? I had a dream about the whole last night. Did you? That's wonderful. Tell me all about it. It was about when he was in the garden of Resvan, and he sent flowers as gifts to the people in Bathdod. Oh, and it had nightingales in it too. They were singing so loudly that the friends could barely hear Bahala when he spoke. It's amazing that you remember that he was in Baghdad at that time. How do you happen to know that? Mom, it was his first place of exile. He was imprisoned in the black pit for being a follower of the Bab. Then he was exiled to Baghdad by the Persian government. After about 10 years, he was told he would be sent to Constantinople. So he moved himself and his family to the Garden of Rezvan for 12 days so he would have more room for visitors. And while he was there, he declared for the first time that he was the promised one of all the ages. Believe it or not, Sarah, I knew all that. I was just a bit surprised that you did. I want to know everything there is to know about Bahá'u'lláh, Mum. It seems that you're well on your way. Do you know the story about how the Shah heard the prisoners chanting in the Black Pit? No, I don't know that story. Can you tell me? You mentioned that Bahá'u'lláh was put in prison in Tehran for being part of a new religion. There were a few other believers in prison with him but there was nearly a hundred others. Thieves, assassins, and highwaymen, Bahá'u'lláh said later. Oh, and Bahá'u'lláh had to wear this really heavy chain, didn't he? That's right. The chain was so heavy, it cut into his flesh and left marks that remained for the rest of his life. The prisoners were chained together in two rows facing each other and the prison was in almost complete darkness. Bahá'u'lláh taught the prisoners to chant a prayer in the darkness of the prison. One row would chant, God is sufficient unto me, 
He is the all-sufficing. And the other row would respond, In him let the trusting trust. They sang so loud that the Shah, whose palace was not far from the underground prison, could hear the sound. He asked what it meant. And when he learned it was the Baha'i prisoners, he became very thoughtful. sent him a letter delivered by a remarkable young man that Bahá'u'lláh named Badi, which means wonderful. In 
the Adrianople, Baha'u'llah revealed tablets addressing some of the kings and rulers of the time, including one to Nasri Din Shah, the king of Iran. Even after the tablets to other rulers had been sent, Baha'u'llah kept back the one which was addressed to the Shah of Iran, waiting for the right person to deliver it by hand. Haji Abdul Majid. Hi. Very welcome. I'm surprised to see you opening the door yourself. Do you not have a son to take care of such things? But. continue to speak well into the night. After opening a way to the young man's heart, Nabil spoke to him about the life of Baha'u'llah. He told him how Baha'u'llah had suffered and how he had been exiled from place to place until he was finally sent to the Ottoman prison, city of Akka. Using Baha'u'llah's own words, Nabil brought Abobozov to tears as together they contemplated how they could be of service to Baha'u'llah. By the next morning, Ogobozog had already began to show signs of spiritual transformation. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to you for the transformation that I see in my son overnight. I thought that nothing could move him, but last night I saw him in tears. What a spell did you cast on him to make his tears flow, to make him a fire with the love of God? It was not my words, dear brother, but the words of Baha'u'llah that moved him. I recanted a tale of the sufferings of Baha'u'llah and recited a poem revealed by the Blessed Perfection himself. Ogobozog is no longer in command of himself, and you must give him up. To lose him in the cause of God is all that I've desired. If he remains firm to the cause, I will happily 
serving myself. Please, take me with you. I must accompany you to go and meet my Lord, Baha'u'llah. While I cannot take you with me, I promise that I will arrange for you to come into the presence of your Lord. Until then, watch and pray. Have you heard that a new young Baha'i has arrived here in Akka? He was so humbly dressed that he was able to enter the city without even being challenged by the guards. He did not know how to find Baha'u'llah, but he saw Abdul Baha in the mosque and secretly gave him a paper with a few verses he had composed to declare his alliance to the cause. Yes, I've heard about that. His name is Abu Zod and he is from Khorasan. Abdul Baha was able to gain an audience for him with the blessed perfection himself. They say the young man was completely transformed by his meeting with Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah said himself that he took a handful of dust, mixed it with the waters of mud and power, breathed into it a new life from his presence and adorn it with the ornament of the name Badi in the kingdom of creation. I am sure we will hear great things about this Badi in the future. We do not have long to wait. <coughs> Already Baha'u'llah has entrusted him to deliver his tablet to the Shah. Although many of the friends have begged Baha'u'llah to allow them to deliver his tablet to the Shah, but he has waited all these years for just the right messenger. Badi asked very humbly to be permitted, and his wish was granted. <coughs> Surely he'll attain the crown of martyrdom for this very important mission. Ya Baha'u'llah. Ya Baha'u'llah, Ya O God, that which you have bestowed upon me through your bounty, do not take back through your justice. Rather, grant me strength so that I may safeguard it. person over there. Go and see. You there. What is your business here? I have come to see the Shah. That is not possible. Why do you want to see the Shah? I have brought him this epistle from a noble person. Give it to me and I will give it to him myself. No, I must give it to the Shah myself. What do you have, young man? O oh, king, I have come to thee from Sheba with a weighty message. Who is this letter from? It is an epistle from His Holiness, Baha'u'llah. Read it to me.
O King of the earth, hearken unto the call of this vessel. Verily, I am a servant who have believed in God and in his sign, and have sacrificed myself in his path. Unto this bear witness the woes of which now beset me, woes the like of which no man ever before sustained. My Lord, the all-knowing, testify to the truth of my words. I have summoned the people unto none save God, thy Lord and the Lord of the world and have endured for love of him such afflictions as the eye of creation hath never beheld. To this testify those whom the veils of human fancy have not deterred from turning onto the most sublime vision, and beyond them, he with whom is the knowledge of all things in the preserved tablet. Stop reading. I've heard enough. If I hear any more, <laughs> I'll become a behind myself. Take it to the Muslim scholars of Islam in Tehran and tell them to prepare a reply. Take this impudent young man to prison. No reward can exceed that of suffering in the path of my Lord. avoided the task of preparing a response to Baha'u'llah and instead recommended that Badi be put to death. After being harshly questioned about his Baha'i connections, without giving his torturers the information they sought, Badi was martyred. For three years, Baha'u'llah continued to extol in his writings the heroism of that youth, characterizing the references made by him to that sublime sacrifice as the salt of my tablets. Wow, but he found just the right gift to give to Bahala, didn't he? And although he gave his life, I don't think that was the most important gift. He gave his pure service and obedience. That's very profound, Sarah. And it's important for us to remember, because we're not really asked to give our lives at this point, are we? But we can all give service and obedience. Do we serve Baha'u'llah, Mum? That's a good question, honey. What do you think? Well, I think Mrs. Dimock serves Baha'u'llah by teaching children's classes. She teaches us to pray, to sing, to study what Baha'u'llah taught, and to share those things with others. great service and a wonderful gift. Do you know that lots of Baha'is serve their communities that way? By teaching children's classes? That and other activities that are essential to help humanity. In addition to children's classes, there are activities for empowering junior youth, study circles for young and old, and devotional gatherings to help people bring more spirituality into their lives. Baha'is are doing that all around Australia and in virtually every country on earth.
the teachers of the children's classes are women. Is it only women who teach children's classes? No, not at all. Well, Holman does say that mothers are the first teachers of children, but he makes it clear that women and men are completely equal in rights and responsibilities. Both of them have the responsibility for raising children. Oh, I knew that. Is it Abdul Baha or, or Baha'u'llah who says that women and men are like the wings of a single bird, that the bird can't fly unless both wings are fully developed? With two wings, with wings, with wings, we can soar through the air. With two wings, today. But I'm not sure we're any closer to figuring out what kind of gift would be appropriate. I don't know about that, Mum. We've seen in the life of Badi that service is a gift that is always acceptable to Baha'u'llah. And we've seen that there are many paths of service open to us in the Baha'i community. So, maybe we just have to pick one. One? How about more than one? There's a quote that I memorized from Abdul Baha that says, Expend your every breath of life in this great cause and dedicate all your days to the service of Baha so that in the end, safe from loss and deprivation, Ye will inherit the heaped-up treasures from the realms above. Wherefore, ye rest ye neither day nor night, and seek no ease. Do you think he means that li 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 literally? No rest, day or night, and no ease? It's not for me to interpret the writings for you, honey. What do you think? I don't think it's possible to go without sleep forever. And I think that we all have to recharge our batteries sometimes. So I don't think that can be what he means. 
I think that it's more about what the purpose of your rest is. If you're resting so that you can continue serving, then maybe that's okay. That sounds like a good answer to me. What service shall we give to Baha'u'llah this 200th anniversary year? We could start by reading his writings. This is the dawn. Where Ash was born, he who begetteth not and who is not begotten. Well is it with him that immerseth himself beneath the ocean of inner meaning that surgeth within this utterance and discovereth the pearls of knowledge and wisdom that lie hid in the words of God, the King, the Exalted, the Mighty, the Powerful. All glory to him who apprehend, apprehendeth the truth and is reckoned with them that are endured with discernment. Say, this is the dawn, whereat the, co the cohorts of the concourse of paradise and the hosts of the angels of holiness descended from heaven, amongst whom was the one who was lifted up on the breezes of the beauty of God, the most glorious unto the ranks of the most exalted concourse. Born on these same breezes, yet another company of angels descended, each bearing aloft a chalice of everlasting life, and proffering it unto them that circle in adoration around the spot wherein the ancient being hath established himself upon the throne of his all-glorious and most bounteous name. All joy to such as have attained his presence, gazed upon his beauty, hearkened unto his melodies, and be quickened by the word that hath issued forth from his sacred and exalted, his glorious and resplendent lips. Say, this is the dawn whereat the most great tree was planted and bore its exalted and peerless fruits by the righteousness of God within each fruit of this tree there repose the seeds of a myriad melodies wherefore O concourse of the spirit we shall acquaint you in accordance with your capacity with some of their celestial songs, that they may attract your hearts and draw you nigh unto God, the Lord of strength, of power and might. All glory be to this dawn, through which the divine luminaries have shone forth above the horizon of sanctity by the leave of God, the almighty, the inaccessible, the Most High. Reading the Risings is good. Now let's add in some singing. Ao 
is my wish, whose presence is my hope, whose remembrance is my desire, whose court of glory is my goal, whose abode is my aim, whose name is my healing, whose love is the radiance of my heart, whose service is my highest aspiration. I beseech thee by thy name, through which thou hast enabled them that have recognized thee, to soar to the sublimest heights of the knowledge of thee, and empowered such as devoutly worship thee to ascend into the precincts of the court of thy holy favors to aid me to turn my face towards thy face to fix mine eyes upon thee and to speak of thy glory i am the one O my lord who hath forgotten all else but thee and turned towards the dayspring of thy grace who hath forsaken all save thyself in the hope of drawing nigh unto thy court Behold me then with mine eyes lifted up towards the seat that shineth with the splendors of the light of thy face. Send down then upon me, O my beloved, that which will enable me to be steadfast in thy cause so that the doubts of the infidels may not hinder me from turning towards thee. Thou art verily the God the, of power, the help in peril, the all-glorious, the almighty. Mum, I think the Hollow will be pleased with the gifts we're planning to give to him. There's just one more thing we have to do. What's that, Farah? We've got to get started in serving humanity. Come on, let's go. We are marching in the light of God. 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 